welcome to uh, one of the last sessions at ICAD and I'm um, really pleased that so many of you have come along. Uh, it's unusual to have a room this full uh, at this stage of a three-day event. Uh, I know a lot of you have been here for the three days and uh, probably feeling a bit tired and uh, and uh, ready to go, but uh, amazing that so many of you are here uh, at this point in the day and I'm, I'm pretty sure it's due to the popularity of uh, Professor Nutt because uh, he has a rather a large following uh, uh, wherever he goes. So uh, it's true to see that here at ICAD as well. Um, so we're delighted to have David returning to us. He's spoken at least once, if not twice, uh, for us before. Um, and David is here today to talk about psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. New, new neuroscientific approaches to addiction and depression, um, and it's a it's a it's an, an interesting and new conversation to be having at ICAD. It's not something that we've discussed before here at this event, and it follows on from a couple of uh, presentations that we've already had uh, in the last couple of days around uh, looking at global drug policy and decriminalisation of drugs and the ability to use substances in therapeutic ways, and that's what David's going to be talking to us about um, this afternoon and I know that um, you'll be talking about a lot of really interesting and very new research that you've been doing um, which I think you're going to find really uh, insightful. Um, so I just need to do a very quick introduction and uh, Professor David Nutt is a psychiatrist and professor of neuropsychopharmacology at Imperial College London. He uses brain imaging techniques to explore causes of addiction and psychiatric, uh, psychiatric disorders and to search for new treatments. David has published over 400 original research papers, reviews and books, eight government reports on drugs and 28 books. It's more than that now, isn't it? It's at least... 31, 31, it's growing all the time. In 2010, the Times Eureka Science Magazine voted him one of the 100 most important figures in British science. In 2013, he was awarded the John Maddox Prize for standing up for science, and uh, he really needs no introduction. So please um, put your hands together and welcome Professor David Nutt. Well, thank you, David. It is, uh, it's nice to be back. The, uh, the last time I was on a panel and uh, with a shaman from uh, Peru, I believe, and uh, a couple of other uh, uh, therapists. And that was actually very really interesting. Uh, and the discussion was extremely uh, active, I can say. So uh, maybe today we'll have a similar kind of um, uh, dialogue. But I'm going to ask you, when you do ask questions, and I will have be plenty of time for questions, just ask a question. Don't stand up and berate me for 20 minutes, all right? <laughs> so I'm going to expand on that earlier presentation. I'm going to talk to you today about the uh, work we've been doing to resurrect uh, the role or the potential role of psychedelics um, in psychotherapy. And I'll explain to you why we're doing it and, uh, and particularly the scientific underpinning of it, which is actually, I think, the critical to its eventually, hopefully, being incorporated into some aspects of, of psychiatric and psychotherapeutic practice. So the first thing to say is that psychedelics have been with us forever. Um, in fact, we're really the only culture that's tried to eliminate them from use, but uh, well, we, we can discuss why that might be subsequently as well. But so here you see on the left, you've got the peyote cactus, you've got some magic mushrooms. On the top right, you've got ayahuasca being brewed up, a, a plant brew which um, produces uh, dimethyltryptamine, DMT, plus a, a substance called harmaline, which prevents the liver breaking down the DMT, so you can get the DMT effect orally, which you wouldn't normally get otherwise. On the bottom right, you've got Amanita muscaris, which is widely used in northern European and um, northern Asian uh, countries as a, uh, a hallucinogen and a mind expander. Then you've got morning glory, where the seeds are the nearest natural product to LSD. And then you've got ergot, and uh, ergot is growing on rye. And the, the, I think perhaps the most seminal image there is the one from the Greek vase. So that's over 3,000 years old. And it shows a Greek noble person using a cocktail of ergot, which is a, a kind of uh, a weak... Um, LSD-like substance, it's the precursor of LSD, and, uh, and alcohol. And, uh, the rich Greeks used to leave their city-states 
in the autumn when the rye started to get infected with the ergot. And they'd have uh, long, week, two week long experiences with this combination of, of two drugs. And they did it because it opened their minds. And, uh, and after those, uh, what they called the mysteries, the Lacinian mysteries, they then went back to their city-states and did what the Greeks were quite good at, which was uh, kind of inventing things like democracy and culture and things like that. So, and they, they were quite taken by the uh, value of their, uh, of their drug combination to help them reframe their way of thinking about life. Now, I don't want to offend anyone, but there is a very interesting argument that actually Christianity is actually uh, a religion which is dis dis also derived from uh, the use of psychedelics, particularly Amanita muscaris. And you see in the middle here, that's a, that's a mosaic from a church in northern Italy showing the tree of life being reformulated as a very large fun uh, mushroom or fungus. And that, th th there's several books have been written about that. The bottom left here is a, a, a a stained glass window from Canterbury Cathedral showing similarly the idea. And the idea is quite compelling, actually, that early Christians use Amanita to uh, expand their ability to engage with God. So it's been around for a long time. It probably underpins most of what we think about as Western society now. But of course, the big breakthrough came when the, we, the first synthetic uh, psychedelic was developed, and that was done in 1943 properly tested in the early 50s, and it was made by this man, Albert Hoffman, and uh, he was trying to find a treatment for uh, migraine and for disorders of blood flow to the brain, and he took ergotamine, which has been used for three or four hundred years to help women uh, contract their uterus after childbirth. He, uh, we know it has profound vascular effects, that's why it's used still day, today to, to treat migraines, and he put some uh, extra groups on it, diethylene amide groups, make it stable, and he turned out with LSD. And that is a remarkable compound. It's extremely potent, microgram quantities. It's extremely long-lasting. Trips last for hours, sometimes days. And it's very safe. And there he is at 100 years old proving that, because he took it regularly, uh, and uh, he lived to over 100. So his brain wasn't fried, although uh, I don't think his house was that color. I think that's a bit of artistic <laughs> creation. Um, the first, the first person in Britain to take LSD was a professor of psychiatry at Birmingham University, and uh, Joel Elkies, he took it in 1953. He died at 103. <laughs> I don't know whether it does make you live long, but it certainly, uh, it certainly doesn't shorten your life if you uh, use it sensibly. Of course, the, the real transformation came with the, um, the writings of this man, Aldous Huxley. Now, he was a remarkable man, a great inter from the most senior intellectual family in the history of Britain, maybe in the world. Uh, and his uh, younger stepbrother, Andrew Huxley, got the Nobel Prize in 1960 for discovering how nerves work. But uh, Aldous wanted to be a doctor and a researcher, but he had terrible problems with his vision, so he couldn't see well enough to make diagnosis. So he went off and did English literature and language at Oxford and wrote books about the sort of decline of the, the English uh, upper classes. And then he took peyote, and that changed the way he thought about the world, and he wrote about it in this book, uh, The Doors of Perception, and, and in many other uh, writings subsequently. And what's interesting about the title of that book, The Doors of Perception, is that he took that term from this quote. This quote is a quote from uh, a man you all know of William Blake, William Blake wrote the words Jerusalem, he wrote the book Jerusalem actually, which has got some nice uh, watercolours of his in, but we use the words for our, our kind of English anthem now. But Blake was a visionary, like many artists, he could see things that other people couldn't see, and he could see them in different ways. And, uh, and, and Blake realised that most people weren't like him, and that their lives were constrained because they couldn't see, as he saw. And he said this, if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. For man has closed himself up till he sees all things through narrow chinks of his cavern. And, uh, and Huxley realized that that's, that was exactly right, and that uh, Mescaline opened up his brain so that he could see more. He could see perhaps as much as Blake could see. 
And he came up with this wonderful quote. The brain is an instrument for focusing the mind. Now, when I give this talk to scientists, and I guess some of you are scientists, but, um, they go, they get, the alone get very agitated now because they say that's dualism, you know, brain and mind. But of course, those of us who work with people who have uh, mind experiences like depression or anxiety or addiction, we understand, you know, that sometimes you have to deal with the mind, sometimes you have to deal with the brain. And I think this is a, such a, such a, uh, a percipient vision of actually how the brain works because we've now proved he was right, and I'll come to that a bit later. So this is how your brain works, for those of you who are not sure. There's your brain in the middle there, and you're seeing something, you're seeing me. Now, your brain is not a camera. I mean, tempting as it is to think it is, but it obviously can't be. So what happens when you see something is that your brain takes the electrical impulses, which the light from whatever you're seeing uh, does on your retina, and it turns those into a whole series of time and frequency complex uh, inputs which go in through the retina, in the optic nerve, and they go into various parts of the brain. And bits of the brain tell you what you are seeing, and other bits of the brain tell you whether it's moving, and other bits of the brain tell you whether it's got color, etc. And then your brain reconstructs an image of what you see. But obviously, it can't do this in real time. It would be ridiculously expensive on computational energy. So the brain uh, essentially makes projections, it makes estimates or um, hypotheses as to what's there. So the first time you saw me standing up, you know, you spent a bit of attention, you know, you actually noticed it was me and you might think, hey, he's wearing a, a shirt with pink stripes and things and uh, I'll watch it. That. But after the first time you've registered that, your brain just assumes I haven't changed and I I probably won't in the course of this lecture, so you haven't got to worry about that. You just keep, look, just keep looking at the slides, all right? But, but it does it, and the brain is extraordinarily efficient. It, it, it makes very, very clever inferences about what's going on, and it reconstructs images. And we, there are games we can play that prove that to you, but I haven't got time to do that today. So that's exactly what happens. And in fact, for most of us, Blake was right. For most of us, we, we see very little of the world. You know, we, we, just, we see what our brain wants us to see. We do look through the chinks in a cavern. But again, for most of us, what we, when we look through those chinks, what we see, as is illustrated here, we see blue sky, and white clouds, and we might see butterflies and green grass. We see nice things for most of us. But not everyone sees that. When depressed people look out into the world, they see much less pleasant things. They see, in extreme cases, they see souls burning in hell, uh, sometimes even kind of literally when they have their nightmares. And when, of course, when addicts look out, what they see is their love object, they see their drug of a choice, the bottle or the needle. And that's, their brains constrain them to a point where that's all they can actually think about and all they can really care about. So the brain focuses the mind and often it can focus it in a malignant and destructive way. So let's get back to psychedelics. Well, they've been around since 1953. It was interesting. In those days, Sando, the company that uh, Hoffman worked for, they made it available. They thought, he said, this is going to revolutionize our understanding of the brain and the mind. And they said, oh, that's good. Let's give it to some scientists. So they gave it to about 1,000 scientists. These days, you wouldn't do it at all. You know, They wouldn't let anyone near a new drug in case we found bad things about it. But in those days, people were interested. And it was used for four reasons. It was used as a psychotomimetic to make people who weren't psychotic experience psychosis and uh, just to sort of make understand psychosis. And when I started off doing medicine back in, like I went up to Oxford to do my PhD in 1978, they were doing studies there. They were giving it to monkeys and making monkeys hallucinate with an, in an attempt to understand the nature of hallucinations. It was used by uh, professionals to self-experiment um, to understand what it was like to have altered states of consciousness. And there were quite a few psychiatrists in this country who had that experience. And it was not untypical for the, the first day you started in psychiatry, the professor or the lead consultant would say, tomorrow you're going to get LSD. And, uh, and they were given LSD. And many of them will rec recount those uh, experiences with enormous uh, 
early clarity and um, actually at quite, long, quite considerable lengths. These were profound experiences for many of them. And it helped, in some cases, for them to understand the nature of mental illness. And then it was used in therapy. And there were two kinds of therapies. The psychedelic psychotherapy, which is where people use quite a high dose to produce a profound disruption of consciousness, out of which a new kind of thinking can emerge. And that's what we have been doing, and I'll talk about that subsequently. And then there was psycholytic psychotherapy, uh, which is more akin to what people are now talking about in terms of microdosing, where you use psychedelics to loosen up the brain processes which allow cognitive flexibility and then allow people to engage more effectively in the typical forms of psychotherapy that were being done. And Britain led the world. Two of the leading or oldest, so not leading, but two of the, the oldest uh, users and, and therapists with LSD are still alive. They're both Americans. They live in, uh, in North London. They came over here to work with Lang back in the 1960s, and they stayed. And uh, Britain uh, was, quite, was pioneering, as you probably know, in terms of conceptual changes in, in psychiatry. And Lang was obviously one of the great leaders of that. And Lang said this very clearly. If you want to become a psychoanalyst, you need to do three things. Read the works of Freud, undergo personal analysis, and take LSD. And um, I don't know how many analysts in the room have done that, but we can talk about it afterwards. And Humphrey Osman was interesting. Humphrey was a, a kind of a, he was a failed British psychiatrist. He couldn't get, easily get work in Britain. So he went off. He went to Saskatoon in Canada, uh, started using LSD. He was the person that introduced Aldous Huxley to LSD. He became quite famous for that. And he said this, he said, to sink in hell or soar angelic, you'll need a pinch of psychedelic. <laughs> that kind of sums it up. It was at the time in the 50s, this was seen as an utter revolution. And it was a revolution. For the first time, you could produce changes in the way people thought, felt, experienced the world. It was seen as so powerful that the National Institute of Health in America funded 140 separate grants to study this as a therapy and understand the mechanisms. So there were 1,000 papers published, 40,000 patients were treated, 40 books were published, six international conferences. And when everything was condensed down and uh, distilled by this, in this um, work of Masters and Houston, they came to the conclusion that the results were overwhelmingly positive, describing safe and effective treatments. And there have been retrospective analyses of large cohorts of people who've been given LSD. So here are four different ones. And I'm not going to go through it all. But the, the point is, actually, the outcomes for these treatments weren't bad, certainly as good as what we do today. And the side effects were very slight. Probably yeah, one suicide, one attempted suicide in a, in a group of 350 patients, which probably less than you'd expect by chance. So, the, so overall. This was a conclusion. Treatment with LSD is not without acute adverse reactions. People can have bad trips. They can get quite anxious. But given adequate psychiatric supervision and proper conditions for its administration, the incidence of such reactions is not great. And I won't go into any comparative data now, but I would argue that the, the side effects of these drugs are considerably less than the side effects of many of the drugs we use today. Uh, but we don't use them. Now, because this is an addiction conference, I think it really is important for you to know about the origins of AA. And this is the man that founded AA. This is Bill Wilson. And Bill Wilson stopped using alcohol as a result of a psychedelic experience. It wasn't actually driven by LSD at the time. It was driven by atropine, which is like scopolamine, which is what some people use when they're taking ayahuasca as well. And uh, Bill had this profound change in his mind and his consciousness a result of this combination of atropine and delirium tremens. And he then realized that that was such a powerful, had such a powerful effect on him, we, that he wanted to induce it in others so that they could also change. And this is what he said. This is his experience. This is his first psychedelic experience. Suddenly the room lit up with a great white light. I was caught up in an ecstasy, which there are no words to describe. It seemed to me in my mind's eye that I was on a mountain, and that a wind, not of air, but of spirit, was blowing. And then it burst upon me that I was a free man. And that's him throwing off the shackles of his alcoholism. And in fact, he didn't drink again for the rest of his life. And he founded AA. And he also incentivized NIH 
to do trials of LSD and alcoholism. In fact, he was also the person that provided the LSD to Osman uh, to give to Huxley. And he was right. Those six trials that NIH conducted of LSD and the treatment of alcoholism, I've got to rem remember here, we're talking about one or two doses only. We're not talking about repeated doses. The doses to change the way people feel about their the drinking in the same way as Bill changed his thoughts. A couple of years ago, these two Norwegians went back and got the old data and did a modern meta-analysis. They put it all into uh, modern spreadsheets and did uh, analysis of variants, etc. And they came up with the conclusion that Bill was right. The LSD is a viable treatment for alcoholism. In fact, the effect size is about 0.9, which is a big effect size. It's bigger than any other treatment we have for alcoholism. And uh, unfortunately, we don't use it because it got banned soon after the last of those trials was done. Now, I've estimated, just on the back of an envelope, really, that since LSD has been banned, probably 150 million people have died of alcoholism uh, worldwide. And you think, well, even if it only helped 10% of them, you know, that's 15 million lives saved. You know, that's kind of, that's more than malaria. But we don't use LSD because it's, because governments have banned it because they're terrified of people using it recreationally. There's no evidence that recreation use has been impacted at all by the ban, but of course science has ended. In fact, there's never been a clinical trial of LSD since, and there's hardly been any studies of the drugs at all since. A few underground therapists, Dan Groff being the most prominent one, has they've pioneered, uh, he works in Slovenia, he's pioneered the, the use of these drugs in underground therapy. And he says this, psychedelics used responsibly and with proper caution would be for psychiatry what the microscope is for biology and medicine and the telescope for astronomy. But they're banned, and why are they banned? And I think it's really important to understand why they were banned. These are the only drugs that have been banned because they changed the way people vote. And it was the, <laughs> it was the Vietnam War that started this. And uh, it was very clear that Amer young Americans were turning against the war, especially when the draft came in, when people would be randomly selected based on the, whether they had an odd or an even last uh, digit to their birth date, to go and fight in a war somewhere they'd never heard of and uh, fighting an enemy they'd never see for a purpose they couldn't understand. A lot of them said no. And they went to San Francisco, they went to Haight-Ashbury, uh, they listened to the Grateful Dead, they took acid, and they became part of the anti-war generation. And this is the right hand picture is the one I think is most, most profound. Drop acid, not bombs. And I have to say, I kind of feel that if we dropped acid in Syria, not bombs, we wouldn't have six million refugees destabilizing the whole of Western Europe. But, but at the time, that didn't accord with the American philosophy. I don't think it does now. And the decision was made that we had to keep dropping bombs in Cambodia and Laos, etc., because that's how we, or the Americans, created their sense of statehood. And people that were opposing that, like Timothy Leary in the middle there, were imprisoned, and the drug was banned. Now, to get a drug banned in those days, uh, it's, 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 you don't have to do that these days. Now we ban everything before it's even been made under the Psychoactive Substance Act. <laughs> But in those days, they had some principles, and the principles were there had to be concerns for health or social damage caused by drugs. So how did they get the drug ban? Well, the first thing was they started creating hysteria in the media. And these have got to be the most ridiculous lies ever be told about any drug. <laughs> and you can see it, the patterns there, you know, sex, drugs, and frogs. You know, it's a dangerous combination. And, uh, Yes, of course, it's just ridiculous. Everyone knows it's just fantasy. But that doesn't matter. Our Misuse of Drugs Act says that if there's social concern, and how better to illustrate social concern than editors of responsible newspapers like this, if they're concerned, then the public must be concerned. And that was a justification for getting the drug ban. Of course, then the, then the film media got into it. Here's one. Here's a film. LSD, Flesh of Devil, you know, sex, youth. And the moral outrage of the old who think it's, the youth should be exterminated, preferably at birth. <laughs> but what was remarkable about the banning of LSD is it occurred in face of opposition from the most powerful man in the world. So here's Bobby Kennedy, would have been president if he hadn't been assassinated. 
And he's saying to, he's the boss, he's Secretary of State to Lyndon Johnson, he is the most powerful man in America, he's the intellect behind Johnson. And he's saying to his bureaucrats, the people who work for him, why, if clinical projects are worthwhile six months ago, why aren't they worthwhile now? They were telling him we had to ban NSD because it had no value, and he knew. They'd spent 140, uh, they'd given 140 grants to study this drug. Why am, we keep on going around and around. If I could get a flat answer about that, I'd be happy. Is there a misunderstanding about my question? He knew they were lying. They knew they were lying, but hell, you know, he couldn't stop them lying. And in the end, he said, I think perhaps we've lost sight of the fact that LSD can be very, very helpful in our society if used properly. One of the reasons he thought that is his wife, who was depressed, was actually having LSD therapy at the time. But even he could not stop. The bureaucrats, the process of banning drugs is so inexorable uh, that it got banned. And I would say that that ban, which has now lasted for over 50 years, is the worst censorship of research in the history of the world. In fact, it's very hard to come up with any censorship of research, which is remotely of the same league as, uh, as the banning of psychedelics and other drugs, of useful drugs like MDMA and, um, and cannabis. The only example I can remotely come up with was 1616 when the Catholic Church banned the telescope. Now, <laughs> they did it for the same reason as LSD was banned. They did it because it changed the way people thought. The science changed people's thinking. The Catholic Church did not want people to know that the earth was not the center of the universe because they might start saying, what else has the Bible got wrong? <laughs> that ban lasted 150 years, but it didn't affect the whole world because the Northern Europeans could carry on using the telescopes with impunity. And actually, there weren't that many, <coughs> there weren't that many astronomers. You know, it wasn't exactly a massive field of research. But the ban on psychedelics has affected every 197 countries have signed up to the UN conventions. There's no country in the world which allows the research. And in 50 years, neuroscience research has gone, expanded exponentially. And this field has been left behind. And that's why I think it's the worst censorship ever. Now, when you talk to the bureaucrats and they say, well, we didn't ban research, we just ban recreational use. Uh, but the reality is that trying to research these drugs is akin to being in a Kafka play. You don't know what the rules are, you don't know where the doors are, you have no idea what you're trying to do. And no one you work with or try to talk with in the Home Office or Department of Health know either. So it's virtually impossible to work with these days. And I just want to, this is a nice piece of work that was published just last year. This looks at the number of publications year on year for LSD in blue and psilocybin. Psilocybin was made a medicine in 1958 and it was a medicine for about nine years. And you can see, the publication went up and up and up. There was huge interest, because with 140 grants being funded in America, there's gonna be loads of publications. And since, since the drugs were made illegal for recreational use, where the red arrow is, you see, publications have just about disappeared. In fact, there were two years, 1990, 1991, there was not a single publication in the whole world on psilocybin. Even though you can, but the reality is you can't because it's impossible to get the drug, it's impossible to get grants to study the drug, and uh, it's impossible to get ethical permission to work with the drug. So it is censorship, and uh, don't believe anyone that tells you it isn't. If you're interested in the background to the, the drug and the drug laws and the, the, imp the different kinds of controls that are implied in, across the different countries, you can read these two papers I've written. The top one is a very detailed in-depth one, and the bottom one is, a, is a, a simpler one, and it's also free, so you can get that downloaded now. Well, people have been fighting back, and uh, before I talk about our work, I'm going to sh share a couple of studies with other groups. Uh, two American groups have been fighting back. Uh, this one is the Bogenschutz study. Bogenschutz decided to rep try to replicate the original LSD and alcoholism trials by using psilocybin, uh, a gentler, shorter-acting psychedelic. And he published his proof of concept study a couple of years ago now. And what you see here, and we don't have we don't have, we don't have a pointer, do we? Well, what you can see is that after the, 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 the first dose of psilocybin was given after the second point there, and there was a dramatic reduction in alcohol consumption and a number of drink-free days as a result of the first administration of psilocybin. And then a few weeks later he gave another dose to maintain the effect. So this was quite uh, supportive evidence. It's not a double-blind trial, it's an open trial, but it does show a profound uh, benefit. 
And of course, what we all do in clinical practice, of course, are open trials. We give people treatments which we believe work, they believe they work, and this seems to work. And then there was a study in John Hopkins uh, by uh, Matt Johnson and Rowan Griffiths, and they gave psilocybin the same principle. You take people who couldn't stop smoking and you give them a, a, a psychedelic dose of psilocybin, 25 milligrams, and you talk them through or they let them go through this experience of changing the way their mind works. And after that ex one experience, 15 out of 18 stopped smoking completely. So that's the most powerful, you see at the bottom there, that, that group, the black blobs at the bottom on the left, those are people, that's urinary, oh, sorry, that's respiratory cotinine levels, and um, urinary cotinine, and if you got below, if you're down at zero, it means you're not smoking at all. So three people carried on smoking, the open triangles and the blacks, so 15 people start smoking completely. I mean, that's an un unprecedented efficacy in the treatment of smoking. And all the other measures like craving and that went down as well. And there have been attempts to use other drugs which are, have recreational value, but which actually are medicines like ketamine. And uh, this is a Russian study. The Russians don't allow any treatment, uh, uh, substitution, opiate substitution therapy. So they're, um, the, the, the clinicians there are quite desperate. And um, Evgeny Krupitsky has pioneered studies with, particularly with ketamine. And this is really rather a remarkable study because um, Basically, he took individuals and gave them one dose of ketamine or three doses of ketamine. And he looked at uh, how long they stayed not using. And uh, what's remarkable about this study is that the 50% um, the, the survival rate uh, persisted for a year. Now, I've been researching the brain mechanisms of heroin addiction for 15 years. And we've never managed to study anyone after three months when they stopped. So this, is, this in itself is remarkable. If people can stay abstinent, half of the population can stay abstinent for a year. That is a, that's a seriously powerful outcome. And now there's a study going on in Exeter by Cillian Morgan looking at ketamine to treat alcoholism to try to help people maintain abstinence there. But I want to focus for the last half of my talk on our research, which I think you'll find, hopefully find interesting in terms of trying to make sense of what might be going on with these drugs. And we kick-started this research with the Beckley Foundation, which is a, an Oxford-based charity interested in the therapeutic utility of, of drugs like psychedelics and cannabis. And the first thing you need to know is that all these psychedelic, these hallucinogens, they all work on a serotonin receptor. Um, it's called the 5-HT2A receptor. And they all bind to that receptor, and their potency at binding, sorry, sorry, their affinity at binding it de determines their potency. So at the top right, see the, you see LSD, the top right circle, really, really high affinity, very, very potent. You need very little. Bottom left, the bottom left pink circle, that's mescaline, it's not very potent, you need a lot. And there's psilocybin, somewhere up to the top end. But all the drugs, the psychedelics, all bind to that receptor, and their affinity determines the dose. So that proves they work through that receptor. And they're all agonists, they stimulate the receptor. There's the magic mushrooms, for those of you who don't know what it looks like. We decided to start with magic mushrooms for a number of reasons. There are uh, a million people a year in Britain use them, never been a death. Uh, they give a relatively uh, controlled, relatively easy trip to manage, last uh, three or four hours if you take it orally. When we started, we couldn't afford to buy enough to give people it orally because it was far too expensive because of the illegal drugs in the scientific community cost about a oh, hundred times more than they cost if they weren't illegal. And, uh, and so we gave it intravenously to start with. And of course the other reason for working with psilocybin is that no journalist or politician knows how to spell it. So they <laughs> Whereas LSD really hits them in the eyes. So where do these drugs work? Well they work in the brain. Now this is a positron emission scan kind of work I do uh, at a routine basis, measuring the number of these receptors in the brain. So these, these are kind of heat maps. Where it's red, or, or where, particularly where it's uh, white hot, that's where the most receptors are. So the first thing to say is that these receptors are in the cortex. That's the bit of the outside of the brain where you do your thinking. They're not elsewhere in the brain. The human brain has more of these receptors per gram than any other brain of any other animal. And uh, 
they're in the most highly evolved parts of the brain. So they're presumably there for a purpose. And why they're there is still a mystery. And some people believe that they're there so we could actually take advantage of mushrooms. I'm not sure I believe that. But, but they're certainly, they'd certainly uh, there's a lot of them, and they must be doing something. So the way to study them, and I started studying these receptors, by the way, I should say, in 1983. Up till recently, all we could do was block them with antagonists. And all antagonists do, if you block all those receptors in your brain, all you get is a massive slow wave sleep, much more slow wave sleep. But this is the first thing that happened when we stimulated them. So this is the first ever brain image of stimulating these receptors in humans with psilocybin. And these images are also color coded. This is our fMRI image. And blue means less activity. So we gave psilocybin to people. They had a, a florid, you know, cute trip. They saw vast numbers of what we call elemental hallucinations, lots of colored lights floating through their eyes. They, some of them floated outside the scanner, and one wandered off to heaven, bowed at the foot of God, and came back. And um, you know, these are profound, you know, hugely powerful experiences. Uh, but nowhere in the brain was the brain turned on. There were just areas of the brain that were turned off. And that was really weird. In fact, it was so weird, we thought there's something wrong. And we did it again. We did a separate study using a similar but subtly different imaging, uh, MRI imaging technique. Got the same results. These drugs switch off brain function. They don't turn it on. That's quite important to how they work, we discovered. So what you see in the top here are the three images of the brain from the side, the top, and the front. And the red areas and the yellow areas are areas of the brain which are called the default mode network. This is a circuit of the brain we've only recently discovered. It's, it's a, a complex uh, system of integrated brain regions which work together. You can see, if you look at the middle image there at the top, you see there's a frontal bit, and there's two bits at the side, and there's a bit in the middle, all red and all hot. The way these images are constructed is that we analyze the activity of all the different, we, we, each of these is an image, uh, each of these images consists of about 6,000 little cubes of brain called voxels, and we measure the activity in each of those 6,000, and we correlate them with each other. And we discover that the front of the brain, the activity there where the green blob is, correlates with the activity at the back, the posterior cingulate cortex. And this, is this, this network is called the default mode network, and it anti-correlates if you see up here, that's the sensory motor cortex. So it anti-correlates with movement and feeling, and it anti-correlates with vision. So what is the default mode network? Well, well, the default mode network is where you do your thinking about yourself. This is actually where your self is, or where your ego emerges from. So I want you, I'm going to activate all your default mode network now. So what you're going to do is this, OK? So you're going to. Close your eyes, all of you close your eyes, and I want you all to think about what you're going to do after this talk. Okay, and you can open it. Now, that process, when you're doing that, your default mode network is massively activated because you're thinking about yourself and you're thinking of what you're going to do and you're planning it in relation to who you know, where you might go, etc. As soon as you open your eyes, the default note shuts off because you want to see things, you want to hear things. But when you're in that state of, of inner reflection, your default mode is dominant. The psychedelics, the bottom image, they shut it off completely. And that's why people have a sense that their self is dissolved under psychedelics, that they actually don't exist as a person anymore. They just exist as atoms out there in space, yes, in the most profound experience. So, so what we can, these drugs switch off the network, the self-network. Why is that important? Oh, sorry, I should just say the same thing is true of LSD. We've now s subsequently done the first ever brain imaging study with LSD, and we found exactly the same thing. You switch off the default mode, and the more you switch it off, the more you get this sense of ego disintegration, etc. So we know that two psychedelics do it. But the default mode has turned out to be hugely important in understanding depression. So on the top image on the left, the controls, and the bottom of that first, that top square here, you've got people with major depressive disorder. And you can see that in, when people are in the state of not doing things in a scanner, 
depressed people have much more of their brain taking part in the default mode. And, uh, and that kind of makes sense, because what is depression? Well, depression is a, a condition where people are ruminating about themselves. They're thinking about things they've done wrong, they're feeling guilty, they're feeling apologetic, they're criticizing themselves. It's an internalizing, self-referential, self-critical disorder. And the doing of that involves this increased activity of the default mode. More of the brain becomes consumed by these depressive thought processes. And at the bottom left, you see a correlation. The greater the connectivity, the more of the brain involved in the default mode, in depression, the greater the scores in rumination, which makes sense. That's what rumination is. It's, it's the process of thinking about yourself and thinking about things you've done wrong. And in fact, the top right hand shows another piece of data which shows where in the brain this overactivity of the default mode is driven from. And it's driven from an area here called the subgenual cingulate. But the point is, depression is a disorder of excessive activity of the default mode. And psychedelics disrupt that. So could they be useful in treating depression? Well, they might well. But then the other angle on depression, and some of you may know this, but maybe many of you won't. The other really interesting conceptual advance in terms of depression in the recent years has been this work of Helen Mayberg, who did brain scanning of people who were depressed. And to her amazement, and to ours, I think, she discovered that in depression, there are some areas of the brain which are overactive, particularly this region down the bottom left called CG25. Now, until she did this brain imaging work, uh, we, all of us in psychiatry and psychotherapy, have been brought up with the, the notion that depression was a disorder caused by loss. You lose your job, you lose your mother, you lose your leg, you get depressed. We thought depression was a loss caused by loss events, and it is often caused by loss events. But we then sort of assumed that loss events meant you lost the ability to have positive emotions. But her work shows something rather different. Her work shows that in some parts of the brain, there's a red, there's red active, there's overactivity. Obviously, the blue areas could be loss, loss of activity, but there are some areas of the brain where there's overactivity in uh, depression. And she went back and quoted this quote, William James, one of the fathers of philosophy and psychology said, and he suffered from depression, and he said, depression is a positive and active anguish a sort of psychical neuralgia, wholly unknown to normal life. And, uh, and Maybrook said, well, if depression is a positive phenomenon driven by overactivity in this region here, CG25, could we switch it off? Now, fortunately at that time, people had just started developing techniques for switching off the brain. It was called deep brain stimulation. She was in Toronto, where they have one of the top neurosurgical centers in the world. 100,000 people in the world now with Parkinson's disease have had their subthalamic nucleus switched off by deep brain stimulation. That's how, it, that's how deep stimu electrical stimulation works in Parkinson's disease, because when you're shaking away and then you switch on a stimulator, you stimulate the subthalamic nucleus and you stop shaking because you inhibit the subthalamic nucleus. And she said to her surgeons, well, if this part of the brain is causing depression, could you switch it off? And they said, sure. And they did. And they showed that if you put electrodes into either side of that region on two, the two hemispheres and turn them on, you can switch off CG25 and people get better. The activity of that region goes down and it stays down if they stay well. And in fact, antidepressants do that. They don't do it instantly. The electrical stimulation does it quickly. SSRIs turn it off over a period of, of weeks. And in fact, it turns out that many treatments, including those of, that some of you do, like CBT, sleep deprivation, even placebo, turns off that region if you get better. Switching off CG25 seems to be a prerequisite for recovery from depression. And we were interested, you know, well, because as I showed you, psilocybin switches off the brain. And one of the reasons it switches off profoundly is CG25. 
And we began to think, well, we've disrupted the default mode network, and that might be good for depression. We've switched on CG25, and it actually turns out that switching on CG25 is what disrupts the default mode network. Maybe it would be useful for depression. We're also, and I know many of you will be interested in this, fascinated by the finding that deep meditation also switches off the same regions. Different sorts of, if you, trans, if you get to transcendental meditation in different, different forms of meditation, you switch off the default mode network too, which may be the basis of mindfulness therapy. So we, we have this interesting kind of coming together of different approaches. And also finally, there was this wonderful study from John Hopkins where Roland Griffiths took people who were just wanted something better in their lives and they get, he gave these middle-aged people uh, a single psilo, uh, psilocybin trip, 25 milligrams, the same as we're going to use in a minute in our depression study. In this controlled setting with psychotherapists, there's Bill Richards, one of the leading psychedelic psychotherapists there. And he gave it to people who just wanted to experience something different. And many of them said it was a profound experience. Many of them, two-thirds, said it was one of the most five meaningful experiences in their lives. And many of them said they felt better for years afterwards. Because that's almost 10 years, totally 10 years old now. And we notice that our subjects coming out of the scanner, I mean, taking psychedelics in the scanner is not the ideal way to take them. I mean, and, um, but still, they often said, I feel better. I feel, you know, I feel, just feel less screwed up about life, etc. So we thought, maybe there is an antidepressant. It's not just well-being. Maybe there's an antidepressant effect. So to our... Uh, <laughs> We actually, there was a, a medical research council had a call, an experimental medicine call in 2012, and we thought, well, let's go for it. Nothing, you know, we're not going to get it, but we haven't lost anything. It's easy grant to write. So we wrote a grant, and we got it. The only time the government's ever funded any research in this field ever, uh, since, certainly since the 1960s. And I think the reason they funded it is because depression is a big problem, and a lot of people don't get well on conventional treatments. But getting the grant was the easy thing. The ethics committee were very, very conservative, very scared of this. It took three iterations in a year to get permission. In the end, they wouldn't give us permission to do a clinical trial. They said, it's far too dangerous, this drug. How do you know it's not going to make people mad? And we said, well, it hasn't kind of yet, really, but so, uh, and, and a thousand, you know, say a million people a year use it, and really very, very few incidences of, 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 a, of anything serious. And they said, no, nope, you can't do a trial. You've got to do a safety study. You've got to give 12 people psilocybin uh, and monitor them, each one for six months. And then if they're all alive at the end, you can come back and do a trial. And it, in the end, we had to give in to that because there was no way of opposing these. I mean, if that's what they wanted to do. I mean, it's no drug, not even the most toxic anti-cancer drug, has, has anyone had to wait six months after a single dose to see if everyone's alive. Well, the good news was they, they allowed us to measure mood as well as life or death in these people, which was good. <laughs> and again, that was the easy bit. The easy, it took 30 months. There's only one place in the world it makes this to a level we could use in patients. And they were, they were not in this country, so we had all the rigmarole of getting licenses and getting imported. So it took 30 months to get the drug supply. It took another two months to get the MHRA to approve. So 32 of the 36 months grant was spent getting ready to do the study all because this drug is treated like it's a very dangerous drug. I have, as a doctor, I can prescribe heroin for pain control, or if I'm a special doctor, I can prescribe it for addiction. But to actually work, to research psilocybin, I have to have a special police check, I have to have a special fridge, I have to have cameras making sure that I'm actually not going to take it and steal it and use it. And it uh, turns out all the costs of this were £1,500 per dose just to protect the world from me selling it on the streets. And I said to the home office, look, not even in Chelsea is anyone going to pay £1,500 for a trip. <laughs> but that's the way, you know, I'm treated as a drug dealer. This drug is treated as if it's uh, plutonium. I mean, it's absurd. But that's just the way the rules are, because the rules are arbitrary and 50 years old. But the effect was amazing. And so in the end, we persuaded the ethics committee to allow us to do 20 subjects because we wanted to do and needed more power to do the brain imaging. And what you see here are every single person's data points from day one week after the treatment up to six months. And you can see that some people 
had amazing... Rec- within a week, some people were completely cured. Under here, it's cured, uh, remission. And the means were at least half of the baselines. They all resistant depression. They'd all failed on two drugs. One had failed on nine. They'd all had CBT. You see, this is an pr- enormously powerful effect at one week, and it maximizes statistically at, uh, out here at five weeks because the error bars are smaller. But you see, there's still, there's still hugely significant at six months. Now, if those of you might know a bit about ketamine, ketamine is a, a tri- another grow, uh, new treatment for depression. The effect of ketamine is over in a week, whereas psilocybin can last for up to six months. So that's very unique. Nothing, never in the history of pharmacology has a treatment had such profound effects and such enduring effects. And that's kind of consistent with what people say about psychedelics. That actually changes the way they think about the world. And if you think about your depression differently, you're not depressed. But we were interested in, in the brain mechanisms underpinning this. So we'd already shown that, that when you give these drugs, you get exactly the opposite of what you expect. The brain switches off rather than turns on. Um, and we wanted to test this new theory. So there's a theory that's been developed. It's a hugely powerful theory that I guess most psychiatrists probably believe this theory, that the way antidepressant drugs work is to switch off the amygdala. So the amygdala is at least little two, two nuclei in the brain on either side. And they're the fear centers. They regulate your response to stress. They're extremely sensitive. They, they, you, your amygdala... Res- yeah, it's turning it on now. You're right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Your amygdala senses stress, senses before you do consciously. So if you see someone who's frightened, your amygdala will react before you know that that person's frightened because your amygdala is scanning the environment to make sure if there's anything bad, you're going to run like hell away from it. And in depression, the amygdala is more active. And one of the theories is that depressed people are depressed because their amygdala is overreactive. So even trivial things like this really upset them. And SSRIs dampen that down. They do it profoundly. They do it so profoundly that you can do analyses like this which show that the SSRIs virtually switch off the amygdala. When you see these images, blue is less, and this is icy cold. SSRIs dampen the amygdala down. It's the most profound thing that they do. So what happens when you get better from your depression when you're on a psychedelic? Well, we we asked... That question. We also asked a subsidiary question: was what happens to the, after a psychedelic to the amygdala response to happy faces and to neutral faces? So we scanned people before and after the psilocybin treatment, and we found that, to our amazement, the amygdala was more reactive following psilocybin, not less. Exactly the opposite of SSRIs, and that. The more reactive the amygdala was the day after the trip, the better the outcome. So, this, so that activity predicted the changes in the Beck depression inventory at a week. So this is exactly the opposite of what antidepressants do. This is lib- freeing up, increasing the activity of the amygdala rather than suppressing it. And so we've come up with a new theory, which is we published just before Christmas, in fact, there are now that we think there are two pharmacological approaches of depression. One of them is the traditional approach, which is the antidepressants. They dampen down the amygdala responses to fearful faces. They have a very mixed effect on happy faces. And many people on antidepressants say, yeah, they don't, they're not so frightened, they're not so fearful, they're not so stressed, but they're not so happy either. They, they kind of get into a rather narrow repertoire of emotions. They're sort of buffered at both ends by the drugs. Whereas... With psychedelics, we see increased reactivity both to uh, the fearful and to the happy faces. And then we're thinking, well, maybe that has implications for, for understanding recovery from depression. That what SSRIs do is they protect you against the stress of life so that you actually cease to be depressed because the continual battering that we have from life to cause depression is uh, no longer having such an impact because you've got this sort of force shield between you and it. Whereas what we think what the uh, psychedelics do is change the way you think about things. So they cease to be stressors. So that becomes an interesting diversion rather than a, a source of a joke rather than a stress. You know, that you can reformulate life to stop it being so stressful. And if you want to, this is a free download. You can go into the paper, J. Psycho Farm, 
uh, November last year. This just goes shows you the different approaches. I just want to say one thing about biology here, that the antidepressants work in the limbic system. This is the emotional system in the brain. And this is the reactive system where the amygdala is, and they dampen it down. Whereas the psychedelics work on the cortex, a much more recently evolved part of the brain. Uh, and what they do there, we think they, they increase cognitive flexibility and they improve your sense of well-being rather than necessarily stop you being stress sensitive. So you can kind of overcome your stressors rather than just be protected against them. And evidence for this, I'm going to give you some evidence now. So they change attitudes. So one of the things we did was give people a, a scale which measures what we called uh, their, well, their attitude to life, really. It's an attitude skill. And um, it turns out that before treatment, the green bars, depressed people have what we call a pessimism bias. They see the world as a nasty, a horrible, threatening, unpleasant place. Well, they're right, it is. But that doesn't help you. I mean, knowing the truth about the world is really not, you know, I mean, you can't do anything about it. It's no point. So the rest of us have what we call optimism bias. And after treatment, optimism bias, uh, or the depression bias anyway, in, the, in, the, in our patients disappears. They're no longer, they're actually more positive about the world, even if it is not better. And here's one patient saying this, my outlook has changed significantly. I'm more aware now it's pointless to get wrapped up in endless negativity. I feel as if I've seen a much clearer picture. And I just want to draw your attention to this I didn't even know there was a journal of humanistic psychology, but I'm proud to have published in it. <laughs> because in that particular um, article, we've summated, or Ros Watts in our group has summated all the testimonials of the 20 patients, their descriptions of what happened during the trip. So they don't, we don't talk to them, we don't do therapy during the trip, but the next day we have an integration session when they talk about their experiences and we try to make sense of it. And we've collected a huge amount of, uh, of narrative data. And she's put it into this paper. And actually, it's one of the best things I've ever written. I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's so different from what I normally write. But it's very compelling. And I think, since most of you are therapists, you'll find it compelling too. So I'll give you some examples of this. Here's some quotes. And this is one of the more common metaphors for what happens. It was like when you defrag a hard drive on your computer. I experienced blocks going into places, things being rearranged in my mind. I visualized it was all put in order, a beautiful experience with those gold blocks going uh, into, black, into black drawers that they would illuminate. And I thought my brain is being defragged. How brilliant is that? So this idea of reframing those internal constructs of depression and turning them into something which is positive rather than negative. My mind works differently now. I ruminate much less, and my thoughts feel ordered, contextualized. Rumination was like thoughts out of context, out of time. Now my thoughts feel like they make sense with content and logical flow. So that's a kind of powerful example of how thinking changes. There was also this quite strong sense of connectedness. Ros just believes that these, the effect is all about connectedness, all about becoming reconnected either with yourself or with nature or with, or with uh, other people. Connected to selves, I had an experience of tenderness towards myself, a feeling of true compassion I'd never felt before. And, you know, there is, of course, in depression, I mean, so much of what depressive thinking is about is about destroying yourself. So this, you can see why this could be a revelation. If you've, been brought up, if you've been brought up with psychological abuse as a kid, so you never, ever felt good towards yourself, this is truly a profound alteration. New perspective. She was so eloquent, she kept calling me my darling. So I think she's reflecting about herself and her inner persona. Life is to be lived, my darling. She talked to me in such a loving way. All those things to say about my life. I started writing music again. Jobs, driving, acting, building, flying, volunteering, travel. It's like ingesting your own psychotherapist. <laughs> So we tried to put a few numbers on this, and this is, uh, this is uh, what Roz came up with. So seven of the 20 felt more connected to their work. Eleven felt more connected to nature. And nine, so at half, felt more connected to a spiritual principle in the same way as uh, Bill Wilson did all those years ago. 
This is a nice quote. Before I enjoyed nature, now I feel part of it. Before I was looking at it as a thing, like TV or a painting. You're part of it. There's no separation or distinction. You are it. So that's connectedness to the world. And I just want to finish by just sharing with you a couple of quotes, because, as I say, all these people have had CBT. Now, I don't... Some of you will be CBT therapists, I guess, and, you know, CBT can be powerful, but these people have failed on CBT, and it's interesting to reflect as to what went wrong, why they didn't respond to CBT. Uh, I just want to share these quotes with you, because I think they're quite illuminating. One of, one of them is, of course, the perennial problem that we have in the NHS, whereas no one sees the same therapist ever more than twice, three times, you know. So you're repeatedly telling people the same problem. I'm sick to the back teeth of telling people again and again my backstory. All the talking therapies, uh, each time you go for eight or six or eight week course of that stuff, you spend the first few weeks going over the stuff, they all ask the questions again, then it's session four, and then you think, who's learning something here? Because I'm not, you are. They all seem to be trying to fit a person into a, a, uh, a preconceived set of patterns. Try to do this, make this your goal, and we'll measure it. But just having those goals set for you is more pressure. And when you don't meet these goals, you feel even worse because you're letting them down and you already fell, feel you're letting yourself down. I got the courage to tell him I never told anyone, all the psychiatrists, just looked at his shoes. Uh, so this is about someone who for the first, you know, was able, wanted to talk about their trauma, their childhood trauma, but people didn't want to talk about it. They just wanted to do CBT. I'm going to finish now. This is a, uh, a quote from the, that man there, you know, the, one of the founders of uh, sort of socialist philosophy and uh, one of the great playwrights, George Bernard Shaw, who said, those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. And what I've hoped to do today is change some of your minds uh, about the potential value of psychedelic therapy. There's no question that there is a science to it now. This isn't mysticism. This isn't Timothy Leary rising up and wanting to change the world. There's a strong underpinning science. And the neuroscience, I think, justifies the use of these drugs therapeutically. What we need to do now is liberate them so people can use them in a safe and effective way. And if we don't, we're going to deny patients who need them. them. But more than that, we're going to drive people into alternative uh, therapies in places where it's much less safe to do it. So let's try to change our minds, try to persuade governments to be much more rational about these drugs. I want to finish by, I want to thank the people who've done all the work, particularly Robin Carr Harris and my team who has really shouldered the burden of most of this research, and Amanda Fielding from the Beckley Foundation. Thank you. So we have time for questions. Now, the way your questions are going to work, we've got one microphone. So you take the microphone, you answer the question, and you hand the microphone back. And then while I'm answering the question, it gets to the next question. OK, so who wants to start? <clears throat> so just so that I'm clear, is this, is this a short term? They only need one or two doses for a long-term effect. Yeah, right. This is a very important question. Hand it back. Hand the microphone back. Someone, <laughs> someone else put their hand up now. There you go. Right. Yeah, thank you for that. Let me just go through the... Th the it's, people think this is going to be cheap. It's not cheap. So the way it works is this. So firstly, people are screened, and we, and we exclude people, particularly who've got a history of psychosis. Um, so they're screened, and then they're assessed. So they go through, you know, obviously, it's a half a day of deep... Um, uh, clinical assessment, psychiatric assessment. Then if they meet the criteria and they're not on any drugs which are going to cause problems, then they come in for the treatment. The treatment is a 25 milligram dose. It's the standard dose that most people are, are using these days. Uh, you take it at 10 o'clock in the morning. Now we're doing it orally because the price has come down because more people are working in this field. So we do it orally and uh, trip lasts for sort of three to four hours and then they go home at the end of the day. There's always two therapists with them. So they introduce to the therapist the day before, when they, and they're prepared, when they're, so they're assessed, they're prepared, and the th two therapists are then with them 
for the whole of the session. And then they come back the next day for the integration session, which is a two or three hours going through what they've learned. And then they're followed up intermittently subsequently. So, so it's a very intensive three-day uh, interaction uh, with a trip in the middle day. And then the effect lasts. What some of you, you that, well, there's no psychotherapy. No, there's no therapy subsequently. So this is quite important. So, and I should just share this with you. So, so there were, we followed them up for uh, three months on a telephone basis. But as I say, there's no ongoing psychotherapy. But you could see some of them are relapsing uh, or slipping back even after a couple of weeks. And by six months, it's become really quite uncertain. In fact, quite a number of them, the ones that really relapsed, they went off and found their own therapy. They went and found other places to have this. They retreated themselves. So I don't, the six-month data is pretty tenuous. But the three-month data, I don't think anyone had gone back onto uh, a psychedelics at that point. But what I'm thinking is that there's half of them seem to do really well. I mean, keeping your quids. This quids is a, a, a quick inventory of depression score. It's a self-rating score, which we think is better than the Beck because it, it taps more into into um, the experience of depression. Uh, those who are below 10, they're kind of pretty well, and those could probably stay on, they might stay well for years. But the ones who slip back, maybe, maybe you need to have a top-up, maybe every, twice a year, three times a year, you might have to go and have another therapeutic session. We don't know if that would work. Now, we're setting up a new trial. We're just going to compare this head-to-head -head with escitalopram. And in this new trial, we're going to do a dose and then at six weeks, we're going to do another dose. And then we're going to see whether at 12 weeks, we, what the impact is. Thank you. So, the back there. Um, thank you very much for a very upbeat presentation. This isn't a torrent of abuse, but I was wondering if you could share with us any of the negative or downside yeah. things that you've been living while you've been doing this. Or you mean the kind of crap I get? Yeah, yeah the, kind of, the, kind of, the kind of critical comments you're getting from colleagues, mm. that sort of stuff. What, why are we not all going to rush out and, mm. and, and advocate this? And you will know more about it than any of mm -hmm. us. Well, because it's, it's, the point is people don't have to criticise. They know it's impossible to do it. I'm not being negative. No, no, your point's well taken. The, the reality is doing this is almost impossible. So having published this paper, this was a recent paper, the, the, the publication in Lancet Psychiatry, which was preceded this, the first 12, that was in 2016. So almost 18 months ago, I get uh, you know, two e three emails a week asking people if they can, people asking me if they can get in and get this treatment. And I have to say no, because no there's no one else giving it. Now, so the reality is that um, it's... I don't need to be criticised because the people who want to criticise me know it isn't going for anywhere anyway. <laughs> you know, they can just keep their they can keep their powder dry until they, <laughs> until there's a chance that it might happen, and then they can come out against it. But um, I think there are two things to say. So the last time I talked here, I think there was one therapist who was extraordinary anti it being used for uh, uh, alcoholism and didn't really believe the, uh, the Bill Wilson experience. I mean, can I just, I'll just tell you a little bit more about what happened. So, so Alcoholics Anonymous was, f we all think of Alcoholics Anonymous now as anti-drug, but it was founded on drugs, and it was quite pro-psychedelics until the drug was made illegal. And then there was a complete schism. Wilson said, well, this is ridiculous, we've got to keep using them, and the others said, well, it's illegal, we've got to be good Americans, and we've got to do what the government tells us. So the, and, of course, the second group won, and now... Now, Alcoholics Anonymous is, is actually, in some ways, even more, you know, pathologically anti-drug, because some people, some chapters don't even allow people to have lithium and stuff. But anyway, that's another story. But, so, you know, there, 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 will, there will be, there's a group of people who strongly believe, and many successful, you know, abstinent addicts who've successfully achieved abstinence, you know, they're quite anti anyone using that, because they've managed it themselves. But the truth is, not everyone manages. So, you know, I think, from my perspective, if we can help people manage to get into that state with just a single administration of a drug, then we should be doing that. The, the other, I mean, the downsides are also, of course, the, the, not just getting the drug, but also there is, we don't know how broadly effective it will be. You know, this, this is a small group of people. Um, mostly they, they, they're people who've written to us and they heard about our research and wanted to take part. We're rolling this out into the real world um, might be quite a different situation. Many people may not be interested in taking it. There may be even resistance from doctors and that. But we're not in the position to, to kind of test that yet because we haven't got the ability to do it. We haven't got any money to do it, really. Yeah. No, you choose the question, because I can't see. I'm blinded by this bloody light. Yeah. 
Thank you for um, your presentation. Um, I've got two points that I'd like to make. One, uh, you've actually helped me change my mind about this because I've heard about it very vaguely and mm. I, even as a professional therapist I've had my own mm. fears around mm. how it could work and you've taken that away. There's two things. Um, one, that I've heard people say that it can help with complex PTSD, especially within um, very toxic relationships where people have lost mm. a complete sense of self. Mm. And the other point I want to make was my dad's been um, diagnosed with Parkinson's, mm. and you mentioned a bit about that, and mm. it's the first time he's ever complained of dep depression, mm. um, mm. and he's in his 80s. So what would be the age range that you mm. would mm -hmm. say that this is for somebody who's already maybe slightly unbalanced mm -hmm. and looking at the latter part of their life? Okay, well, they're two really good questions. So the p complex PTSD is a, it's a challenging issue. Um, our, our own uh, approach is actually we are not using psychedelics for complex PTSD. We're using MDMA. Um, and that's, that trial has actually started in the States. We're now, we'll be treating our first patient in Bristol next week because we don't, there's so little anecdotal experience of psychedelics in that field. I mean, it might, it might be transformational, we don't know, but on the other hand, it might not. It might actually make things... Uh, and it wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be the person that putting someone through a, a, a more extreme uh, re-encountering with their trauma under psychedelics. So it, it may well be something that, that we should do in the future, but it's not something we're doing at present. And if people are doing it, or got experience of individuals who've, who've gone and self-administered... So it's just for those of you who don't know, there's only one country in the world where psilocybin is legal. It's not legal as psilocybin, but it's legal as the truffle. And so the Dutch, as you probably all know, are kind of much more rational people than, than us. And, and when psilocybin, was, the mushroom, was made illegal, they did exactly what the law said. They made the mushroom illegal, but they didn't make the truffle illegal. So the truffle's a bit that grows under the soil. So in the Netherlands, you can go and you can have truffle treatments, and it's it's huge business now. I mean, loads of people are, are going there for enlightenment kind of sessions and also for depression. So, but even there, I'm not I'm not hearing reports of people with PTSD um, getting better. Whereas if you go, you, there's hundreds of reports of people using it for depression. I again, I get probably one in, one email a week, people telling me how they've used psychedelics themselves to get over their depression. So PTSD, I think MDMA is certainly the safer and more. We've got much more evidence about the value of, P of MDMA in PTSD than we have this. In terms of age, yeah, um, the sad truth is I think these receptors get less sensitive as you get older. So you, by all means, try it on your dad, but don't be surprised if it doesn't work. <laughs> but with his consent, please. I have a pharmacology question for you, actually. Oh, cool. Um, <laughs> um, please forgive me if this is known, and I just don't know it, but um, is the signaling pathway or signaling cascade known mm -hmm. for agonists of 5-HT2A mm -hmm. in the way that it is known for other 5-HT mm -hmm. agonists, um, you know, fluoxetine? Is this known yet? Okay, good question. So the answer is yes and no. Um, so we know clearly how SSRIs work. That's the top line here, the blue line. They increase serotonin in the synapse, and that is working through a 5-HT1A receptor, and that is dampening down stress responses in the amygdala, hippocampus, hypothalamus, and that's all through G-protein-coupled receptors, if you understand what that is. Yes, good. Okay. The psychedelic, the 2A, is more complicated. And it's one of the great mysteries of pharmacology as to why some drugs, there are drugs which bind to that receptor that are agonists that don't, aren't psychedelic, drugs like lysuride. And, uh, and there are others that do bind, and there's still questionably whether serotonin is psychedelic to this receptor or not. I mean, it, I suspect it is, but it's hard to prove. And the answer to that is, there's a, are you a pharmacologist? Okay, so the answer is that there are two signaling pathways. And, uh, and one of them is G-protein coupled and the other is through the beta arresting. And it seems like there's somehow, for reasons we don't fully understand, 
the psychedelic drugs push you down the beta arresting pathway, and the non psychedelics like lysuride go down the G protein pathway. But the actual molecular mechanism that, that switch is still not understood. Yeah. Uh, Professor, I had a question. Uh, any particular reason for choosing psilocybin instead of any of the other? Yeah, so the reason we chose psilocybin was because it's a, it's a widely used drug. As I say, you know, we reckon a million young people in this country use magic mushrooms every year. I don't think there's ever been a death, you know. So we, we know empirically it's very safe. Um, we know that it gives a relatively short trip. So the trip lasts, if you take it orally, three to four hours, whereas LSD, much more problematic because, you know, the trip lasts for eight hours or so and you have to keep people in overnight. So we can do all this in a day. They can come in in the morning given the drug at 10, they can go home at 6, so it makes, it's a more tractable, and it's also less stressful on them, and um, because, you know, an eight-hour trip, if you're, you know, never had it before, is actually, you know, could be really quite exhausting, whereas, so that's the other reason, and as, and I said it's, um, it's kind of got, it's got that nice balance between duration, potency, etc., it's not super potent, and we, with LSD, you know, I mean, it's, it's so potent, like, you know, one thinks maybe if you just got the dose wrong a little bit, then you could have bad effects. Whereas with psilocybin, it's, we've had very few. We had one person went into a kind of uh, elective mutism for a few hours afterwards. But he said it was okay. You know, he said he was fine. He was just somewhere. He just didn't want to talk, and that was fine. <laughs> and we, don't, we don't make them talk. We don't do any interaction while they're... If they want to talk, they can, but we don't, you know, I mean, we kept asking if he was all right, and he kind of just didn't even reply. But, with it, but, but he was all right at the end, thankfully. <laughs> But we're trying to make them talk, you know, we don't, we're, not, we're not using this for psychotherapy. Although, just to say, I actually think there's probably going to be quite a lot of interest in low-dosing, micro-dosing, to facilitate psychotherapy. So we are teeing up a trial, if we get funding, a trial of low-dose psilocybin in OCD to help people be better able to engage with, the, with, with their exposure therapy when they're, res they're terrified of even going into exposure. Maybe we could loosen things up a little bit with a, a sub-psychedelic dose. So that's something we're trying to explore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, you basically just touched on what I was going to ask you. Um, what are your thoughts on microdosing in general? Yeah, my thought, this is, this is truly, it's one of the most, I had a surreal conversation last week with the New York Times. Um, they said uh, they're, <laughs> they're doing a special issue of their magazine. They're going to, on the best books on microdosing. And they're asking experts, what are their favorite books on microdosing? <laughs> and I said, I would never read a book on microdosing. I'm a scientist, you know. But the fact is now people are writing <laughs> articles about the whole literature on microdosing when there's no science at all. No one's ever done a microdosing study. So my thoughts are that it's credible and we are teeing up a microdosing study. Extremely difficult to do. So this is difficult, right? This is difficult because you, uh, you bring people in and you give them a psychedelic and then you've got to keep them for the day and then... Send them home. But if you're doing a microdosing study, you've got to bring them in twice a week for six weeks. Because even an atom of LSD is illegal. So we have to, you know, everything, microdosing doesn't get rid of the regulations, it gets rid of the side effects. But, so no one's done it. And we're, you know, we're hoping to do it. It'll take another year or two. I think it's credible. I think it's possible that low doses do lo uh, turn on those receptors enough to make the brain a bit more flexible. And it might make you more creative. But then again, it could all be very powerful placebo. So I'm, I'm open-minded. Uh, so inevitably, I suppose there'd be a concern of um, individuals going off piste and self-medicating after yeah. they've potentially gone through the trials. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. My understanding that, I think, is it, is it hypertolerance that a lot of psychedelics have, which would mean that potentially, or put it another way, what um, concerns would there be if individuals were to do that? How, well, the concerns, the yeah, my concerns would be that they didn't know what they were getting and they were getting the wrong dose uh, they were, and they would go psychotic. Those would be my concerns. I mean, I think you can mitigate those by doing a bit of research around, you know, I mean, there are certainly underground therapists in Britain that seem to be producing results and people aren't going to hospital. And in the Netherlands, there are certainly lots of well-established treatment centers there. So I think it's, if you do your research sensibly, you can probably find people that can do it. And, and give you access without uh, putting you at risk. I think going to Peru and uh, Brazil is a slightly riskier thing to do um, because now that's become something of a, an exercise in hallucinations rather than therapy. So I kind of guard against that, frankly. 
Yeah, there's the loads at the back there. Thank you very much. That was super interesting. Um, I just wanted to know, do you know anything about whether um, DMT affects the same sort of brain regions as psilocybin LSD? Um, LSD sorry. So, yeah, we've done the first ever, I didn't show it to you, but the first ever DMT imaging study produces exactly the same effect. But it's, uh, we have to do it intravenously because you can't take it orally uh, unless you do ayahuasca, which we don't want, we're not allowed to do because it's a plant product and it might be dangerous. You know, I mean, don't go there. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, it desynchronizes the brain profoundly in the same way as LSD and, uh, and uh, psilocybin. We haven't done the imaging. The imaging is being done, but the EG changes are exactly the same as the LSD. And um, so it's a profound desynchronization. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Uh, yeah, hi there. I was, uh, I was wondering about what, uh, in the trials that have been conducted, are people who've had a lot of previous exposure to psychedelic drugs, mm-hmm. are they, is the outcome different for, to them than it would be for maybe somebody that's, that's never tried psychedelics? Before? That's a really good question. The answer is we don't know. Um, I mean, our, I think, I can't remember, about a quarter of ours were psychedelic prior experience, but not recently. We don't take people who are, you know, are using on a regular basis because of tolerance. Um, I think it's, I think the diff, I think it's, if you were to just to randomly give people psychedelics, I don't think they do as well. I think the people that go into these trials are interested in the concept, interested in novelty, interested in trying to explore the potential. Uh, and that's going to be the big challenge. I think, I mean, I think certainly for our, my generation, most people, we so, they believe so many of the lies that have been told about them and they'd be terrified of even going near them. I think it might be, take several generations before this becomes more accepted as a, as a therapy. Yeah? I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the contrast between how MDMA works on the brain versus the classical yes. psychedelics. Yes, yes. Also because you were saying that MDMA is used for PTSD and uh, the psychedelics for depression, but of course some people are depressed because of childhood yeah. trauma and various things, which is not too similar from PTSD. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just trying to find an image. I haven't got, I've got I, we've done the imaging studies with, with MDMA as well, but I don't have time to talk about them. But um, this just, so, th- so the main effect of psychedelics is in the cortex, in this default mode part of the cortex, okay? MDMA doesn't have any cortical effect. Its major effect is amygdala and hippocampus. And, and why that is, is because it releases a lot of serotonin, but serotonin is not a very potent agonist at the 2A receptor. But it's a very potent agonist at the 1A receptor. So the dampening down of the limbic system is what MDMA does acutely and profoundly. Now, there are some effects of MDMA which can be blocked by blocking the 2A receptor. So it's, it's not, it may be MDMA does have a complex mixture of 1A and 2A effects, but it doesn't, it's not a hallucinogen like... Uh, because it doesn't uncouple that network there. Um, so, yeah, now, so the question, I, it, it, so you were asking about PTSD, which, sorry, no, depression, yeah. So, absolutely, so could it work in depression because people have been traumatized? Well, that's, I think that's an extremely sensible and plausible approach. We know even trauma, only half of the people that get traumatized 20% may severely traumatized, maybe 30% end up with PTSD, and 30% end up with depression. We don't know why. We don't know what divides that. Um, so it certainly it's perfectly plausible that people who've got depression as a result of trauma might well benefit from it. And that's actually what we're doing now. The study in Bristol now is actually a trial of alcoholism in people who've got, who are drinking to deal with childhood trauma. See if we can use the MDMA to help overcome the trauma so they don't need to drink anymore. And that'll read out hopefully in about 18 months. In the back there, there's a question at the back. Thank you so much for your talk. I spent some time in the Peruvian Amazon last November uh-huh. and I drank ayahuasca yeah. several times. And it's irreversibly changed my life for the better as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. I don't yeah. try and have sex with dolphins or eat frogs, but I'm having yeah. a pretty good life. <laughs> But I'm curious, you say, you talk about the difference, uh, yeah. hallucinations. Mm. I'm curious to know your opinion. If I, all the people in the camp I visited, 
And we talked about visions. Mm. No one used the word hallucinations on ayahuasca. Yes, yes, and we, yes, it was very yes. much a recognition of helping yeah. us get in touch with things that have happened in our life and mm. reliving them, feeling them, etc. Yeah, bit. yeah. Did that make sense to you? Or was that yeah, no, it's a, well, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. So, yes, are they... <laughs> Yeah, the difference in hallucination and a vision is, I guess, whether you want it or not. I don't know, and whether you're accepting and receiving of it. I mean, it's a really, it's a. I mean, there are clearly quite a lot of cultural um, influences on that. There's this wonderful dialogue between Gordon Wasson, the guy that actually discovered the uh, active ingredient of the uh, ayahuasca uh, combination. The uh, actually the DMT was the active ingredient. And he's having a conversation with, um, oh God, I've forgotten the name. You know, the Mexican guy who wrote all the books. Castaneda, yeah? Yes, yeah. so he's having this combination. And the guy, you know, the Mexican saying, have you seen the, have you seen the, uh, the did you see the jaguar and the serpent? And Watson says, no, I didn't, I just saw lights. And he says, God, you know, do you know what this drug is? And he said, yeah, yeah, I discovered it. Uh, but he's never seen the drug, you know, he'd never seen the serpent in the Jaguar, whereas the people who are you know, in, into the culture and uh, have kind of brought up perhaps with the expectation will potentially get that. And, it, and that's one of these things, these drugs are very good. At, well, one of their effects, shall I say, is allowing people to get where they want to go. I mean, do you know, all know about the, the Marsh Chapel experiment? So the miracle at Marsh Chapel was uh, it's a remarkable, it's one of, you know, it's one of the most remarkable experiments ever done. And uh, it was done at, um, at Harvard back in the days of, uh, of uh, psychedelia, you know, um, with Leary and co. And uh, one of Leary's colleagues gave, I think, it was, I think it, there were 20 trainee priests, and it was Good Friday, and he randomised them half to psilocybin and half to placebo. And they spent the Good Friday, those of you who know about Good Friday, is you can spend a lot of time in church on Good Friday. And uh, the, I think eight of the ten who had psilocybin had a religious experience. You know, they saw God, they became, the, the, this Good Friday turned them into believers, whereas I think one of the placebo. So this is, a, you know, if, you, if you're seeking something, psychedelics are a good way of helping you find it, I think. All right. One more question. We can allow one more if you want. Cheers. Is there a question at the point? No? No? All right, we don't have to. Don't be feel obliged to ask. Oh, there's one there. Um, just with the Russians um, using ketamine for opiate yeah. um, substitution, do you think that that might be an area that we. It's not substitution. Into? It's so, not substitution. Sorry. Wrong. It's sorry. It's 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 treatment. treatment. It's it's allowing people to reconceptualize their lives so they're not addicted anymore. Yeah, I think ketamine, but ketamine is not as good as psychedelics. It's not as good as because it. The reason is that, um, that where ketamine works, ketamine works at a pretty superficial level of the cortex. It doesn't actually deal with the long-standing interconnections which underpin. So I mean, you know, depression, addiction. These are processes which, for most people have been going on for years, if not decades. And they're really learnt. The brain has become very proficient at reproducing the, you know, the constructs of cognitions, etc. Ketamine stops you thinking for an hour or two because cause it takes off your cortex, but it doesn't deal with the deeper changes. And that's why I think psychedelics are much better. Thank you. All right. Is that enough? Thanks a lot. Thank Cheers. You.